The reason I'm so passionate about medicine today is that we are on the cusp of a seismic revolution. Now, what will really finally tip this over? Because how can, how can the data that are out there be resisted much longer? I mean, how can anybody who begins to get a little discomfort in their chest say, gee, I'd like to go and get sawed in half. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. All you have to do is take this pile of delicious food that's destroying you, and let's put it over here and forget it. And we'll bring on this other pile of delicious food that will enhance your health. And there's no exp added expense because you got to eat. There's no downside or side effects, right? There's no threat of, of mortality or serious morbidity because you're not going to get side effects that are going to be crippling you. And you're not going to risk your life with the event itself. Uh, I mean, the same thing even goes, uh, let's take it a step further to the first thing that often happens is patients will have some symptoms and they'll get a thing called a stress test. Now, the stress test, they failed. But they're otherwise they're okay, but they just get these symptoms when they're kind of exerting themselves or it comes in frequently, but they fail the stress test. Now, if you then go to the next step and have the angiogram, now you're on the train. It is so hard to get off. But what we have found increasingly in when patient, when we can get patients, when they have first have that discomfort, we find that uh, literally, especially if it's been just several months in the offing, that this is something they can turn around like a chip shot. Once they just suddenly begin to restore their endothelial cells, nitric oxide levels come up, and psh, their chest pain goes away, and now if they will stay with it, usually in eight to 10 months or what have you, when they repeat the stress test, it'll either be markedly improved or back to normal. We want them to understand what are the foods that every time that has passed their lips, they have devastated, compromised, and injured the capacity of their endothelial cell to make nitric oxide. Because all experts would agree that's where the devastation occurs. But we have to tell them what are the foods that do this. Oil, all oils, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, oil in a cracker, oil in bread, oil in salad dressing, Oil injures endothelial cells, as does anything with a mother or face, meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt, and maple syrup, molasses, and honey in excess. You gotta go easy on the sugar. I mean, fructose injures endothelial cells. And I'm a little bit fussy on caffeine. There was a nice study that I'm pretty, uh, persuaded by from Italy in uh, April, uh, the spring of 2010, European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. The Italians took two groups of young subjects, one getting decaf, the other getting caffeinated coffee. And then they did the brachylotary tourniquet test. Switch groups. It was only the group that had caffeine that compromised their endothelial function with the brachylotary tourniquet test. So those are the foods that injure. So what do we want to have you eat now that you've taken, we've taken those away? We want, we want people to eat these absolutely wonderful whole food plant-based nutrition that we talk about. All these whole grains for your cereal, bread, and pasta, and 101 different types of legumes or beans, and all these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, and fruit. I have a patient who used to walk his dog along the beach every day. He sold art. Uh, and he began noticing, well, just a little bit of chest heaviness. And that, after it had been there for two weeks, he saw his family doctor who sent him to a cardiologist, and he had a stress test that he failed, and he got an angiogram, and he had 100% blockage of the right coronary artery, which had recannulated. I mean, he had nice collaterals going around it. He had another 90% uh, blockage of his LAD, left anterior descending, and about a 75 to 80% of his circumflex. So he was advised to have a triple bypass, and he demurred and said, I don't think I'll do this, and he found us over the internet. He was absolutely got into it. Within 10 days, his pain was gone. Now, uh, the thing that you have to, at least that I'm a little bit fussy about, 
is that if you think of the blockage or the plaque in somebody who has heart disease as an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation, then if I'm going to accelerate this healing, and this is where I have to be a little bit mean, not quite as mean as I look, but <laughs> I really want to have antioxidants, not the kind you buy with pills at a, at a uh, health food store, because not only are those not going to work, they're going to be harmful. So I want to have natural antioxidants. Yes, blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries on a cereal, great every day, no question. But nothing can beat the antioxidant power of the green leafy vegetables. What are they? Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula and asparagus. And that's just a few of them. However, how much and how often? I want for my patients with heart disease, I want them to have something the size of their fist after it has been cooked for five and a half to six minutes. So it's nice and tender. Then they can anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic vinegar. So they've got something just delicious. Have that alongside breakfast. Again, as a mid-morning snack. Again, with your luncheon sandwich. How about another mid-afternoon? Of course, at dinner time. And I adore it when you have that evening snack of kale. Well, what are we getting? <laughs> you are pouring these powerful antioxidants, literally, over these inflammatory lesions all day long. And they just begin to feel better, they blossom. You, they know they're never going to gain weight from the green leafy vegetables. They're not going to go to the emergency room with an overdose of some vitamin. <laughs> the body doesn't work that way. There is new research that has come from the, the clinic that I, I think is worth mentioning because Stanley Hazen and his team have found that in persons who are omnivores, omnivores have a, uh, a bacterial flora that is nasty in that it, when it metabolizes these animal foods they're eating that have lecithin and carnitine, they produce a molecule, trimethylamine, which rapidly is oxidized to trimethylamine oxide which is nasty in terms of uh, its risk for causing cardiovascular disease. But the other thing they found out, if they take a piece of steak and give it to somebody who's fully plant-based, they don't make any TMAO. They don't have the bacteria to cause it. And uh, the exciting and the powerful thing about what I've just said is that it totally validates a plant-based approach to this illness. We would have to structure a way that, that, that physicians have to be reimbursed for a, a willingness to show patients lifestyle change. Uh, that is really one of the things that's, that's holding it back generally now. And that physicians have to be certified and have training and know how to do this. You just can't open the checkbook to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that says, I'm going to be a, a lifestyle changer. They have to have somehow uh, credentialing. Now, the other way that this whole thing, it seems to me, could be turned around rapidly uh, is if somehow we could get this into schools. Children have a way of showing their parents the right direction. And at the same time, uh, you, you would just stop this tremendously stressful job of trying to persuade persons who are now in their 50s and 60s to change a lifetime of habits. Because if the lifetime, I mean, if their habits from the time they were kids was correct to respect uh, food and understand what food was gonna hurt them and what was food was gonna help them, this could be changed. And the other thing that I think will change it rapidly uh, is when a closed insurance plan, like let's say Kaiser, gets it for their for all the people that they have. And suddenly they're saving millions of dollars by helping all these clientele. In a heartbeat, all these other insurance companies, uh, Humana, United Healthcare, Aetna, they will be on this like a ton of bricks. Yeah. So I remain passionate about the future of, uh, <laughs> of where this is going. <laughs>